this next section is breaking business as usual by Priyank. But before we get started, I wanted to do a couple reminders. First of all, is that um, if you have a cell phone, please silence it. Even the vibration can kind of be picked up by the mics. If you have a question, there's going to be a mic in the middle that's you can use that one. That way it's recorded. The people on the stream will see it. And we'd also like to, you know, thank our sponsors. We have our diamond sponsor of Adobe, our gold sponsors are Prisma Cloud and Toyota, and Pretox, a Prex tech. Um, it's their support and the support of all of our others and the donors who help us do this. So with no further ado, and because we're running a little behind, Priyank. Thank you so much. And now my mic is working. Awesome. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Making Business as Usual. We're going to talk about attacking Android Enterprise Solutions. Uh, show of hands, how many of you access work did on your personal devices? Pretty much everyone, I believe. Uh, how many of you know the policies which are being applied to your device? All right, let's find out. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm currently a red teamer at Microsoft. Uh, previously, I was in consulting and doing, did some application security as, uh, sorry, application development as well. Then spoke at uh, various industry conferences. I'm interested in application security, IoT, as well as Namish Razor. Uh, at home, I'm the blue teamer uh, because my toddler is always trying to break things. So I have, I have the, I'm the one who's preventing those. So, what is Android Enterprise? It's basically a set of APIs which are provided by Google for developers to build enter uh, enterprise management solutions for Android devices. And there are two, two uh, primary ways of doing this. So there was like a company owned uh, device which is also known as core pliable device. Uh, and this device basically operates in a device admin mode where your administration, administrator push, pushes up some policies on your whole device that also applies to your personal uh, profile, uh, personal apps, as well as personal data. Uh, and then this, this is also known as the fully managed device. And the, and the newer uh, thing is like the personally owned uh, devices, which is also known as the BYOD, wherein you set up a separate profile on your work device and your company pushes the policies, but that's only applicable to the profile uh, of, that of the, uh, the work uh, profile, but not on your personal profile. So the trend is towards the latter because it's usually cheaper for the organizations to do this. Also, they don't have to deal with you know, lost and stolen devices and stuff like that. And the whole uh, responsibility is now on the employee or the user of this uh, device who's now going to manage certain things. Uh, device admin is here to stay because some countries like China, they still require, uh, they don't support that kind of a solution where, wherein the, the EMM provider has to have root on the device as well. So let's talk, we're going to, we're going to talk uh, about the, the personally owned work profile in this talk. Uh, so all of those talks will be about that. So this is how you set up. When, when, you, when you enroll your device, uh, you're going to see that the company is going to create a work profile on your device. So this is Android specific. Uh, what happens is the, the application which initiates this is going to start the setup and then activate the work profile and then push the profile, uh, uh, push the device settings on, onto this profile. So as you can see, after the setup, uh, it's going to look like uh, basically like this, right? Uh, the, the, the image on the right, right? So you can see there's like a work tray, and you can see all these work devices, uh, work apps. And then on the personal tray, you have all your personal devices. So this is the, uh, and you can kind of pause your work profile, and what happens is like basically it turns off the work profile, uh, the work apps doesn't actually run when you when you turn it on, uh, turn it off, and then you can toggle it on back again. So let's get some terminology here. So EMM is basically the enterprise mobility management. Uh, it's it's an application which allows IT administrators to push the policies onto your device and also during the setup. This is the first application which you download onto your app uh, on your phone. So and then. So basically, under the hood, it's the device policy controller. This is the class which Android Enterprise exports. And then it communicates with the EMM software. So think like uh, Microsoft Intune, right? Or Samsung Knox Manage, or uh, 
you know, mobile iron. So you're going you're gonna to have a device which, uh, you're going to have an application which is going to uh, help you enroll the device. And then on the server side, it's going to communicate with the EMM software where your, where your IT admin is going to see all the policies on your phone as well as uh, manage, uh, manage the policies as suited. So with that, let's look at the threat model. What could go wrong? Uh, so we're going to talk about, you know, what would happen from, you know, uh, the the threat model on, on a mobile device. Like, so for example, file system communications. Like, what if you install a work app on a personal profile or personal prof personal app on a work profile? You're going to look at network communications. What are these connected apps? How how to take care of the EMM app security? How to take care of the work application security? As well as uh, the final thread is about the rootkits where if uh, if your device is compromised, which is like a big part of the threat model and why we are doing this. Uh, but that is going to happen. So look at look at this thing. So you use a regular Play Store to sideload a work app. Now what happens is like if you, if the employee owns the, dev uh, the device, you can pretty much sideload any application if you have ADB or something like that installed. Uh, any any kind of debugger, right? Uh, some apps allow allow them to be installed as a personal profile. So here's the thing: like it's difficult to run compliance check on a personal app, and only server side conditional access checks can prevent this. So as an IT admin, you need to ensure that work apps cannot be authenticated against your SSO endpoint uh, to access corp data if they are in the personal profile. So that's like the biggest check you you need to do. And do not onboard rogue work apps onto the system, even, they are, even if they are just accessing employee you know, data like email or name or stuff like that. So that was like pretty straightforward, but this is more interesting. So the whole concept of separation of work profile and social profile is to give a separation uh, between the data, right? There's a data boundary there. However, if you can just install uh, as a so basically what happens is like a, a separate user is created on Android profile. So uh, in a, Android is a multi-user system, right? So uh, for, for your regular user, your UID 0. And when you have like a work profile installed, it's typically UID 10. Or in this case, I, I'm running it as 11 because I uninstalled and reinstalled it. So for example, if I install an application for that particular user, that, that application will be, uh, you know, uh, visible under the work tray. As you can see, I just installed Reddit under my work profile, right? So what happens is like the trust boundary, the whole premise is now broken because uh, I can now interact with work applications using the IPC, like uh, inter-process communications. I can access using, uh, access their content providers, their logs, their, uh, even their storage, uh, public storage, like documents and do downloads and stuff like that. So the trust boundary is basically broken. Like it, in this case, the work profile is pretty much uh, useless. So uh, the things which ID administrators uh, should be aware of is to whitelist the work applications and run compliance checks, checks periodically uh, to have like whether non-approved apps are installed within the work profile. And then depends on the EMM provider uh, whether you know. You, so all EMM providers are going to give you a list of work apps being already installed. So you just have to run the checks and uh, boot any any application which is not uh, you know liable. So. So as I was saying, because the trust boundary is broken, uh, you can actually interact with any work, uh, you know, work app there. So by design, for example, most in, most intents do not cross from one profile to another. Any personal app, whether malicious or not, cannot fire an intent to a work application because uh, the the system doesn't even know that. So and secondly, like file URI. So if you have like absolute path hardcoded in your application, that's not going to work inside the work profile. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, the download and data directory, as you can see, it's basically another path. So, so I, I'm here logged in as root just to demonstrate, but basically it's inside MNT user emulated uh, user ID 11. Inside download folder, you can see that some work profile, some work app has downloaded this file. Uh, but if I install a personal app inside a work profile, that app can actually access this. So basically, the trust bound is broken. Uh, with regards to network communications, uh, they, they basically have a shared network, uh, network certificate store. So uh, people who are 
have been pen testing here for a while. As you know, you have to install a root certificate on Android to intercept any kind of network communications, uh, HTTPS and SSL enabled communications. As you can see, if you install a system cert in, in the, under this path, which is like system ATC security CSRTs, uh, and you can look at it, it's trusted credentials, you can see that this is the personal uh, set of HTTPS certificate, and you can see the work one, and both of them are actually visible uh, are active, right? Because just because I installed it in the one location. So there is no actual separation between the certificate store, which is like huge. Because if a malware is able to install a root certificate, which is how typically malware install, uh, works, uh, rootkit is probably going to uh, you know, install a uh, root certificate to intercept all the network communications. And that's going to work for work profile as well. So. Uh, so an EMM provider may or may not detect this. This is like pretty, pretty much, uh, you know, very difficult to detect. So we should be aware of this issue as well. And this is by design. There's nothing can be done about it. Uh, same about device logs. Device logs are basically a stream of logs via you can access via Logcat. Work apps, personal apps, they all output to the same thing. So if your work, work application security is pretty weak, uh, a huge amount of data is being leaked in, in the device logs as well. So again, this is inherited from Linux, and this is by design. Except that Android apps are like more chattier in their logs because you can see all the activities, all the you know network calls, all this stuff. Depending on the work work apps, uh, you you can pretty much see everything there. Uh, and then there's like the special class of applications called connected work apps. So as an end user, you're going to see, if you, if you just uh, navigate to settings, app, and special app access, you're going to see connected work and, work and personal apps. So basically, this is designed to break the boundary between these two profiles. So for example, uh, in this current configuration, you can see Google and Gboard are basically connected. So the keyboard, which, which you are using to access uh, work applications and your personal applications are sharing data. So again, there's no separation at all. So as an end user, uh, you, you would want to disable them if you're not comfortable with data sharing, because this is going to be by default. So at least Google ones are. And, and, and an admin has to ensure that whether you're, you guys are comfortable with these defaults at all. So uh, as you can see, those they, they basically run under a different user. So for example, this U0 is running as a user ID 0, as I told you. And this is like the user uh, 11, which is the work profile. It's the same uh, app, but it's run in a different context. However, they are still sharing data between each other. So let's move on to the EMM application security itself. Uh, so as I, as I explained, the basic concept of work profile is, is the concept of a profile admin. Earlier, there was device admin. But there's a, this is a profile admin, which is actually, if you think about it, it's more like a super root. Why? Because even profile, profile admin enforces work profiles, which cannot be bypassed even with root access. So for example, a very basic uh, device policy, which is enforced via EMF providers, is the enforcement of a password, com password, password complexity, right? So on your device, you're required to have like six digit numeric characters, or alphanumeric, or whatever, whatever your org requires, right? As you can see, even with root, uh, you cannot basically uh, reset that. So you see, I'm root here, and then if I just clear the, lo uh, you know, the, the lock screen settings, that's not going to work. Uh, if I try to set it disable, disable the lock screen for that particular user, it's, it says that it's, it's true, but it doesn't actually disable the lock screen. So you see that even the root access, the profile admin settings cannot be bypassed. And that is the reason why the EMM uh, application is very powerful here. And so a runtime application self-protection becomes very important here. Why? Because you could use dynamic instrumentation tools like Frida to, to hook into this EMM application itself. And if they are not doing any runtime protection, so you can basically change all of these settings from basically from the, from the uh, accessing all the methods of this DPC, which, uh, sorry, EMM app uh, from within the memory and do, and do stuff whatever you want. So for example, in this case, uh, I have hooked into the process. So this name of the application is uh, changed to, you know, to protect the innocent. But basically, what I did was uh, I 
I just instantiated a Java object with native settings. And you can see that the default password complexity is set as three. Uh, I would just change it to two, and you can see that it actually has worked there. And then you can pretty much, pretty much enumerate all the methods of an EMM app, and you can pretty much access any, any method which a device policy controller uh, exports. So that's like the set of Android Enterprise APIs, and you can pretty much bypass anything there. And then there are some other EMM uh, application features which we should be aware of. So for example, sending logs uh, via troubleshooting via email, uh, it breaks out of the work profile confinement because these apps have these design built, uh, you know, uh, built in. And then uh, one of the classic ones is authentication before device enrollment. So when you start the device enrollment, you have to authenticate to your org, right? And that kind of leaks your token because the device isn't trusted yet but you still have the token on the device. So if the device is compromised in some way, then that basically you know, uh, defeats the purpose. And that's a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, and then obviously you should check for device integrity first because that's, that's the you know, solution there. And then um, there are like general application security con considerations for work applications. Now these are like you know, general OWASP level security guidelines, uh, sensitive data storage, network communications, platform level stuff, you know, and again, the runtime application uh, protection as well. Uh, you should also be, IT administrators should also be aware of alternate forms of authentication. So for example, uh, so this is like a growing trend that if work applications provide a different uh, way of authenticating to your uh, enterprise, uh, for example, linked devices, right? So you go to uh, your, an application which uh, provides a web interface and you have a, you can add authorized devices. You could just enter the security code, like six digit pin onto your phone and you're simply authenticated as that person. So think of like WhatsApp web, you know, and stuff like that. That was just one example, but uh, that basically bypasses your MDM restrictions. Why? Because you are not supposed to be authenticated before your device is enrolled, right? So. IT administrator, administrator should be uh, aware of, uh, you know, such applications and such applications should be booted off. All right, let's move on to the final threat, uh, which is like rootkits. So rootkits are users with root access, which you should assume your users will eventually gain root access. They can almost always evade detection. Uh, but can they access work data? So it actually depends if the work profile is locked or not. So let's, uh, let's have a crash course on file-based encryption uh, on Android. So the way this works is like, uh, because Android is a multi-user system, uh, they had to introduce this file-based encryption. Earlier it was like device encryption where uh, either the whole device is encrypted or not, nothing is encrypted, right? And there used to be a key and there was like this whole uh, thing about where to store the key and all that stuff. But now with hardware security modules, it's becoming much easier to manage the keys and stuff like that. So, and, and, and there's also this new feature called direct boot in Android where even when, the, when, the, when the device boots up, you can see certain applications are on by default, right? Your alarm clock, your calendar, your uh, stuff like that, right? Anything which appears on the lock screen. And until you enter your passcode, uh, none of the underlying file system is actually decrypted. So, so that's the DE storage, that's a device encrypted storage. It's accessible, that is accessible once the device is boot as after the user unlocks the device. Now credential storage is, uh, is like specific to the profile. So you can, you can unlock the device, but your work applications might still not be accessible because those are being run under a separate user. So that's the reason like a CE storage was created. Uh, and because the work profile is running under a separate user, you see uh, ID10, uh, CE storage is only available after, after the, uh, the work profile lock is uh, unlocked. So that gives us to, brings us to an interesting, uh, you know, uh, default thing, where basically once you enroll, by default, a one lock is enabled for work profile, as you can see in the settings. Uh, what, what happens is like, when the user unlocks the device, the work profile is unlocked as well, right? So when you, you just have to enter your passcode once, and as you can see in the logs, uh, you can see the installed CE key for user 10. Right, and then, uh, so basically we're gonna trace these calls and see how this works, but uh, 
uh, this one lock setting is basically uh, makes it easier for attackers, right? And uh, so remember there was like this functionality to pause your work apps. Basically what it does is it just throws away the CE key, the credential encrypted key, and it deletes it. So what happens is like uh, uh, the, directories, the directory structure for all the work applications look like this, which is basically it's locked and encrypted. And until you set, uh, you know, uh, key in the passcode again, uh, it's not going to work. However, as, you, as I said, because if it's just one lock, uh, the CE key, even though it's uninstalled, is, you don't actually need any passcode here. So as we see, uh, you, can, you can still get access with root, but not by directly accessing the keys, as, you, as we're going to see. So I started tracing the calls, like, where is the DE key? Uh, if the DE key is already installed, that means the device has been unlocked at least once in its lifetime after being powered on. But the CE key for that particular user is not. Uh, so here's how it works. It, the lock setting service for Android, these are all Android system calls. It calls the storage manager service, which calls uh, Volt, which is like a volume, volume daemon. And then it installs the CE key. Uh, but I found there was like an easier path, which calls the request quite mode enabled method. And basically, uh, when, when you hit the pause or unpause work profile uh, button, this is the method being called, basically. Uh, so I'm looking at the documentation and seeing that the scholar must be either be a, f a foreground default launcher or have one of these permissions, which is like manage users or modify quite mode. Now, these are very powerful uh, permissions. So I don't think launcher has this. So I'm going to attack the leakage, weakest link here, right? So, so I just got hold of the launcher. So by default on Pixel, you have like the Nexus uh, launcher, right? So uh, I just hook this process, uh, hook this launcher, uh, and then initiate a, uh, a call to the, uh, the request quite mode enable method with the following parameters, uh, passing in the user handler instance and the parameter, which is uh, the Boolean false. Uh, and this works even in a backgrounded stage, and even when the device is locked. So I just reported to Google because that, that's basically a lock screen bypass where you can access a work data even though the work, pro work profile was locked and the device was also locked. Uh, they rejected it. They're like, oh, this is not an issue. Why? Because foreground default launcher does not mean the launcher has to be in foreground. So I don't know what this means, but if an attacker has a full, full chain exploit, this is pretty much game, like your work profile data is pretty much uh, toasted at this point. So, and then talking about more threats from root crits, uh, which can actually prevent actual locking as well. So if you hit pause on the work profile, uh, so consider the scenario, like a device is reported as uh, compromised or stolen, right? And then an admin initiates like a lock of the of the device, so that you know any anyone cannot try to access the work work data. What what a root could could do is like basically get a handle on the work profile's data directory, as I showed you before, like the directory which was encrypted, and they could just like open random handles on the whole device. Uh, what was going to happen is when you hit pause, FScript is trying to lock and encrypt all the device directories, and that's just not going to work because there are open handles there. So even though the UI is going to show that the work profile is locked, the IT admin is going to get a notification that the work profile is locked, but it's actually not. And anyone, uh, a rootkit or a malware or a user with root access can actually access this. I reported this to Google as well again, and then the answer is like, they gave me a pretty good, decent answer about FScript, how it works, but basically uh, this is how it is. Uh, it's again inherited from Linux there. Uh, Moving on, so if there are like separate locks, so, so these were the scenarios where just a, uh, uh, one lock is enabled by default for, for the parent and work profile, right? Uh, so I just observed that the CE key is installed on the first, first unlock as we discussed, right? And the work apps are still running in background, but uh, so if, if, if a device with a weak or no passcode, remember that the device admin can only enforce pro, uh, policies on uh, work profiles, right? So there could be a, you know, a scenario where an administrator says that, okay, your personal, personal device passcode could be a little bit weaker, but your work profile has to be very, very strong. 
This this could still be an issue. The conclusion is that do not enforce only uh, work profile password because this can be bypassed. There is a disclosure in process, uh, and it's pretty simple. Uh, I can't I can't discuss the whole exploit here, but basically, you 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 will be able to bypass it even even as a rootkit or as a user end user with uh, root access there. So, uh, so yeah, for for uh, like. For IT administrator, do not enforce only work profile password. Uh, and of course, know the difference. So as I said, like, you set the password complexity on parent profile versus just on the work profile. Uh, so this is under the hood. This is basically like the action set. Uh, uh, action set new password prompts a user for uh, to set a work, prof work challenge. But action set new parent profile password prompts for a user to set the device lock. So you need to make sure that then this is also applicable to the EMM work applications developer to uh, ensure that which, which uh, API you're actually calling to enforce those. All right, so moving on. If work lock is enabled, can you interact with the work applications? So can you like get simply call the activity manager and start any any of the work application service, uh, so the answer is like no because when when the phone is locked, you're going to get errors like this where uh, you know background start is not allowed, service instant, and then you know stuff like that. So basically, the intent is not honored, and this, so this is what I was expecting when uh, when I was trying to initiate a pause or resume work profile from from the earlier exploit, which did not work, and they said that oh this foreground doesn't really work, but there are uh, they have mechanisms to block background apps especially when uh, the device is locked. And this is like a very powerful feature, actually. Uh, but probably we don't need to interact with these work applications uh, interactively by using Activity Manager, because if the device is locked and the credential encryption CE key is already installed, it's pretty much decrypted on file system. And what you can do is like you could probably just, uh, you know, uh, enumerate the file system, get hold of the tokens or uh, anything like that, and then simply interact interactively uh, interact with the API endpoints itself, right? So you could still get access of work to work data over there. All right. So moving on to the next threat, how? Do, uh, what if an end user uh, disables a work applications? So imagine a scenario where device policies uh, compel you to install antivirus software or VPN software, like, you know, stuff like that, right? Defender or any anti-malware software. And by design, your end user shouldn't be able to uninstall those, right? Because that's like a bypassing a policy and also you're kind of risking the corporate data there on the device. So the device policy manager, DPM, can enforce this via this method set in uninstalled blocked. However, uh, I found out a way to actually disable it. So you can see that when I, when I actually try to disable it using package manager for that particular user using, uh, so I said read it as a mandatory application. And you can see that you cannot disable a protected app. But if you, if there's like a separate method, it's like kind of undocumented, but this is like pretty much known in the XDA community, community that you can kind of use this instead of disable, you use disable user and that would just work. So that mandatory app was now effectively disabled. I reported to Google and they were like, uh, they, you know, the IT administrator should expect to, you know, uh, block USB debugging by default. And this isn't documented on their, on their method. So I'm like, that's just stupid. So whatever. So USB debugging is like really important and IT administrator should enforce this at, in all cases because uh, a lot of settings are dependent on that. So as you see, this, this works. All right, and so from a privacy point of view, you might want to make sure that if Android ID is queried. So Android ID is basically a 64-bit number unique to each combination of uh, an application's signing key, a user, and the device. And this device may change if the factory reset is performed or if an APK signing key get changes, but post Android uh, 8.0 apps with different signing keys uh, running on the same device can no longer see that same user ID. So, so this is like one of the methods I was uh, evaluating one of the uh, EMM application, 
as I can say that you can see safety net is basically used to attest device integrity on Android. Uh, and they can kind of query the Android ID for that application. And this is like pretty much unique for between the installs. Uh, although other applications cannot use this, uh, but this is, this is something to be aware of, especially because in certain cases, uh, work profiles are supported from Android 5.0 until today. Uh, but if, if, if your devices are like 8.0 and 0, because there are like certain devices on the field which are like pretty much never updated. Right, and they are using they're running Android. So this is something to be aware of. All right, so mitigations and takeaways. Moving on to the last slide. Uh, so developers of EMM uh, solutions. So these, as we discussed, this is like the Achilles heel of you know uh, enforcing management policies. And as we can see that, but even if by some measure we can. Uh, debug the applications or perform runtime dynamic instrumentation on the EMM app, it's pretty much by possible, even with, with or without root, right? Uh, IT, IT admins of these uh, policies should be aware of certain policies where, you know, uh, you can kind of fine tune the available options. As I said, like, for example, certain settings have to be enabled in order for other settings to be uh, uh, actually effective. And the work applications developer is, has to follow the zero trust approach of uh, developing secure applications. So that's like the basic, like the OWASP security stuff, right? And the end user has to recognize and accept the privacy implications of installing a management profile on, on your device. So uh, last but not the least, these are like the default settings. Uh, you have to set all of these settings, but there are like a few of them which are critical enforcement of other settings. And the key point is like, none of these are set by default, right? So for example, I have like these major EMM providers, Intune, so Nox Manage, and Mobile Iron. Uh, the ones which we really want to care about is the, the uh, first three of them. The USB debugging is disabled. Uh, as you can see, in, in, Ma in Nox Manage, it's allowed. Uh, in Yuvanti, in Yuvanti Mobile Iron is also enabled. And you have to detect rooted devices. So this is important for, for malware and uh, you know, users who are able to act, get root on the, on the device, right? So you want to block those devices, actively manage them. Uh, Google Play Integrity Product, which is now the Play, uh, Play API safety net is now kind of deprecated, is basically not configured on any of them. So it's, it's up to us to basically do this. And then require antivirus, anti-malware, or anti-spyware Again, none of this is set. Uh, microphone, this was like an interesting setting, but it was enabled for work applications by default on mobile iron. So that was like very interesting to me. The other ones have not set. And then minimum security patch level is like not configured. So in a nutshell, uh, none of the security settings are set. If you just click next, 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 and deploy a policy, you're like pretty much toast because none of those policies are actually going to have any effect there. So with that, uh, I think we are end. Any questions? Any questions? Hard for you. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, certificates, and uh, I thought you had the Quartz Figure certificate in there, uh, it's definitely a big concern, especially since the sharing of devices and applications are going to go through that. What do you yep. recommend for administrators to defend that particular issue? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for network security, so there are like a, two things you can do, I believe. Uh, if you have, I think at Microsoft, we, we enforce the root certificate requirement using Windows Defender, and then that installs its own root certificate. So you are only concerned about work applications, right? Uh, but I think if the, device, if the user already or a rootkit already has root access, there's nothing you can do. That's, that's like, you know, what, I'm sorry to say, but because what is going to happen is because it is shared, uh, the key thread here was like the user installs a CSRT thinking that it's only going to work for personal apps, but it actually is all your work, work data is also going through that. So that's like the key thread there. Uh, but yeah, if they, they really want to do it, they can do it. I mean, 
<laughs> the, the way to override is probably tunnel everything through VPN. Because uh, I think then the local device settings are not honored. Yeah, that's, that's true for everything, actually. It's irrespective of work profile. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so same question, but how would administrators block uh, people trying to attack with Frida? Yeah, so, so you have to harden the EMM application like anything. So, so for example, we uh, our homegrown application, I think it's called Comedy Portal, that's like really good at detecting whether you, you are being runtime debugged. Uh, so there are like a few ways you can do. So you can enumerate the, the loaded libraries within the application. So you're going to see frida.lib.so, like shared object, right? You could, uh, you could have like canary checks within the memory of the application, which is going to just, uh, you know, change the, the, uh, the hashes of the library, which, which, which is, which is being used. There are like two or three of them. Uh, I don't, I don't recall all of them, but basically you have to harden your application before, before being, uh, you know, shipped over to your users. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult problem. See, that's the thing, right? I mean, uh, the user actually owns the runtime. So given persistent efforts, they're going to they're gonna bypass. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Okay.